Well, good morning. I'm just thrilled to see you all this morning, and I will just tell you right off the bat that I am always so humbled to be on this campus. When uh, people ask me, just because of traveling, if I know of a campus where God just seems to be moving consistently and persistently, I always tell them, yes, I know of one, and it's Oklahoma Baptist University. And I'm just so grateful for the privilege of being here, and I don't want to waste any of these moments. And um, let me just tell you that, that Dean Griffin asked me if I would uh, speak on the book of Jonah. And so, you know, when, when you travel and speak, usually you tell people yes before you have thought about that. And so I, I told him I would do that. And um, then it meant that I had to study. So uh, I just want to tell you that I've had a wonderful time these last several days uh, reviewing this wonderful book of Jonah. Actually, I, I taught a course on it recently. And uh, just going back into those notes and hearing what God was saying to my own heart about Jonah. Now, he mentioned a few moments ago that, that I've, had, um, I've had a little... Uh, bit of tumult in my own life personally so I'm going to ask you to ask you to pray for me um, and it fits right in with the book of Jonah if if I were to give a theme to the book of Jonah it would be this he cares and really what God cares about is whether you say yes and at the close of, uh, of this hour I'll give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything like that, but uh, because, you know, you're smart enough to know where to find the people who can give you the help and the leadership and the mentorship that you need. But I am going to ask you if this morning you're willing to say yes, and you say yes to what? Well, I'll, I'll explain that, okay? Um, let me just begin by saying that God cares for you personally, and this is not the message, but this is going to let you see into my heart. Uh, six weeks and two days ago, as I was lying in bed beside her, holding her hand, and quoting scripture to her, my wife won a nine-year battle with cancer. And the Lord just came into that room and whispered, come away, my love, and he took her to be with him. And I'm going to tell you that my emotions, as you can imagine, are a little raw right now because I met Jeannie on a college campus, the other OBU, OBU East. And we don't talk about that much, but that's where I was and that's where she was. And uh, I remember, I mean, I remember the very day that I met her. And uh, as I was told a lot of people, she came bouncing across the campus with these two ponytails and a mattress uh, blouse, blue jean skirt, penny loafers, pennies in them. And she was wearing this perfume called Get Your Man. And it did, I, I guarantee you. And uh, I'm not supposed to tell this because, you know, everybody wants everybody not to know things like this, especially my two grandkids down here shouldn't know this. But, but six weeks later, I proposed to her, and nine months later, we were married. And life for us has been one gospel adventure. And right now, the adventure has taken a new, a new turn for me. You know, God gives us grace to live and grace to die. And... Um, grace to let go and grace to go on I'm discovering and you pray for me as I learn how to focus more on where she is than where she isn't sometimes I get to thinking about where she isn't which is with me and it gets pretty raw but I like to focus on on where she is and and in the midst of that I'll just be honest with you uh, in the midst of that I had this little moment where I was pouting uh, I was out walking one day and it occurred to me that for 49 years, we were married just shy, 49 years, one month shy. For 49 years, I had been the most important person in somebody's life, right? And she had been the most important person in my life. Everything we did, we did together. I mean, we were just, we were just together all the time. So, so this really... It was a moment when I was just crying out to God, and I'll admit I was, I was crying out to God. And I said, Lord, 
you know, what's that like? In fact, when coming home from the memorial service, I was sort of in and getting out of traffic, and then all of a sudden it occurred to me, it doesn't make any difference whether I got home in five minutes or in five hours or in five days because there was nobody home that was going to be there. And I was no longer the most important person in someone's life. So I said, Lord, nobody cares for me like that. And the Lord said, well, let me just talk to you about that. And, and you say, how did he say that? Well, it just, you know, I mean, I'm walking, and this is what he's speaking to my heart. <laughs> Here's what he said, and I'll share this with you because I want you to know that what, wherever you find yourself on this campus, God cares. He cares about you. He cares for you. And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, you know, how, how long were you all married? And I said, well, Lord, we were married right at, right at you know that. 40, you're, you're God. Uh, 40, 49 years. He said, okay, I just want to make sure you have that down. And um, during that 49 years, you know, conservatively, if you, had, uh, if you had just cut down to about 20 sins a day, that'd be roughly, you know, a quarter of a million or more sins. Uh, did you tell her before you... You proposed to her, now these are the quarter million sins I'm going to commit while we're married and have to do with things I think, things I see, some that I don't want you to know about. There, there are these sins. Did you tell her about that? I said, no, no, she probably wouldn't have married me. Right. If she had known about those, she wouldn't have married you, and she was married to you for 49 years on this earth, okay? Now, the Lord said, you know, you were on my mind, and this is all scriptural, before this world was ever created. And I knew you. I knew the sins you were going to commit. And, and everyone else's in the entire planet for all of history. I was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I knew what you did was going to cost me the crucifixion. And yet we went on with the program. And for all those thousands of years leading up to the cross, I knew you and I loved you. And while, you, while I was on the cross, I was there specifically for you, though generally for everyone, but specifically for you. And, and for a couple of thousand years after I was resurrected, I've just been waiting along, waiting around for you to come on the scene, knowing that when you did, you were going to commit all those horrible sins. And then I had the privilege when you finally arrived... 1944 years later when you finally got on the scene when you finally arrived I had the privilege of watching you commit all those sins and by the way big shot you're not through but I love you and I'm going to love you throughout all eternity so don't just walk around on this track and say God no one, nobody cares for me I love you and the Lord cares for you he really does now that's not the message that's just the run-up to what I want to share with you from the book of Jonah all right because what I want to do is to to encourage you with this thought the the Lord cares whether you say yes to him yeah he does he cares whether you say yes. He cares when you say yes. He cares where you say yes. And he cares why you say yes. And if he cares for you like that, shouldn't you care for others? Now, some of you may have your Bible. You know, the text obviously is the book of Jonah. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be too tough for us. There are only 48 verses in the book of Jonah. And, uh, uh, you know, the message is very simple. And Everybody knows the story of Jonah, or at least most people do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it a little bit here in a few moments and just try to prove my point and then give you, the jury, an opportunity to render your verdict by saying yes, if you will. And I pray to God that you will because I, I pray by the end of this study you'll see why it's so important to do so. Uh, Jonah, of course, uh, was a prophet, son of Amittai, prophet back about 27, between 27 and 2800 years ago. Jeroboam II was the, was the king in Israel. But, but God asked Jonah to do something that he rarely asked prophets to do. Normally prophets prophesied to their own and warned them. And God asked Jonah to go to the wickedest city that I can imagine was on the, on the face of the earth. And that is the city of Nineveh. Now when you think Nineveh, 
Think northern Iraq. Think Mosul. And uh, originally, Nineveh was on one side of the Tigris River and Mosul was on the other side. But now Mosul is so big that it's taken in the, uh, the, also the, the perimeters of, uh, of Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh, uh, by the way, you might have read recently that ISIS destroyed the tomb of Jonah in Mosul. And that's why, uh, because Mosul is around the city of Nineveh. And it was the, the legendary tomb of Jonah, of course, that they, that they destroyed. But way before there was an ISIS or way, way before there was even that kind of a faith system, the reality was that the inhabitants of Nineveh, Nineveh were the, were the epitome of wickedness. They were the original terrorists, literally. If you read history about Nineveh, they were Assyrians. And um, the, the Assyrians would come sweeping down every year when it was, you know, the good time to do battle. They would come sweeping down into Israel. And finally, under Sennacherib, 150 years later, they got all the way to the, to the, the walls of the city of Jero Jerusalem when Hezekiah was king. But they would, they would just grind up people. They did the most atrocious things. You read what ISIS is doing now, they taught them. I mean, they were the most vicious, vindictive, vile people you can imagine. And what they did to people when they conquered them was absolutely horrendous. I mean, you read about it, it makes you want to throw up. It was just awful. And so God says to this prophet who thinks, you know, my, I have a pretty secure job being a prophet here in Israel. God said to Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. And Nineveh was one of the biggest cities in the world at that time. The world only had about 75 million people on the entire globe compared to seven plus billion now. Um, and so this was a big city. We know it had at least 120,000 people in it, which would have been a big city. Uh, anyway, the walls were seven miles around. It took three days to walk straight across uh, the city. But, but, but maybe there were more. And when it says 120,000, thousand in the last chapter of Jonah it says who don't know their right hand from their left some people believe that means 120,000 children and babies well maybe that's the case if so it would have been close to half a million people but I can't imagine a city really being that big in in those days but it was a big city for its time and so God said to Jonah I want you to go be a prophet now I'm going to walk through Jonah as if it were well, it is a book with four chapters, or if it was a play with four acts, and I'd like for you to mentally write something down at the end of each of these chapters, okay? Uh, chapter one, of course, is where God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh. What does Jonah do? Jonah goes exactly in the opposite direction. He goes down to Joppa on the Mediterranean Sea, gets on a ship, and goes west, not east. And you, you remember, <laughs> you remember that the moment Jonah did this, God, God was fairly disturbed about it, but he, he set up a, a plan in motion to get Jonah's attention. And this plan involved animal life. This plan involved human life. This plan involved uh, uh, the natural forces of the universe. I mean, when you say no to God, God has lots of things at his disposal to convince you otherwise, okay? And so Jonah just, he, he got his nose bent out of joint a little bit about this. And so the Lord then set in motion a plan. You remember what happened? The, the storm came up on the sea. The sailors are running around throwing stuff overboard. And finally, the captain finds Jonah asleep in the, you know, I mean, it, you can sleep. That's a good way to say no to God. Just, you can go the wrong way, but you can also just go to sleep. And so he began to question him about it. You remember the story. And he found out that Jonah was a Hebrew. He feared God. And he also feared, and he was running from God. They, they found him by casting lots. I mean, literally, they drew straws, and, uh, so to speak. And Jonah got the short straw. And so they began to, began to ask him, grilled him. When he told them that he served Jehovah, uh, they, you know, that was just one more God as far as they were concerned. And so they still tried to save his life. I mean, they were more honorable than he was. But it didn't work, and the storm got more and more vicious. And finally, Jonah said to them, when they said, what can we do? He said, the only thing you can do is chunk me over in the water. They did. The storm stopped. And by the way, the guys on the boat, they turned to God. It says they began to call out on God. And 
Jonah in the water got swallowed up by a great fish. Now, there's some of you who never get beyond that. You really worry about that. Let me just tell you, the fact to me that Jesus said that really happened, and Jesus is the one who was in the tomb dead for three days and came out alive, that pretty much settles it for me. I mean, it's okay. He can handle that. But Jonah was swallowed up by a great fish. That's where, that's where chapter 1, act 1, ends. What I want to say to you is this. Just write down this sentence. God cares whether I say yes. In other words, he is, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you say he's the Lord of your life, then, then God is going to work in your life to get you where he wants you. The Bible says he is working to conform you to the image of his Son. The Bible says that we're to let the outworking of our salvation be with fear and trembling for it's God's who's working within us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. As someone says, you can't say that he's your Lord and say no to him at the same time. It has to be yes, Lord. God. So the sentence is, God cares whether I say yes. He really does. You say, well, you know, I, I'm, I've got studies, man. I've got a thousand things to do, man. I'm just trying to get used to this campus, you might be saying, or I'm, I'm getting out of here, man. I'm going to get this train robbed and get off this campus this May. I'll be gone. Well, hey, let me just tell you, God cares whether you say yes to him. If you don't believe it, just see all the things that God did to get Jonah to say yes. By, by the way, uh, I, I'm, I'm really fond of quoting an old poem which, which some of you all have, may have even heard me quote. Before. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, and when God wants to mold a man to play his noblest part, and when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world will be amazed, watch his methods. Watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and he hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands and his tortured heart's crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends and sometimes breaks whom his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him and by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about and God is about getting you and me to say yes to him because that's best for us. He cares. So just at the bottom of that chapter, chapter ends, God cares whether I say yes. Chapter 2, you know chapter 2 in the book of Jonah. It's pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Jonah is in the fish. And uh, <laughs> he's there for three days and three nights. This is what Jesus said this is true. In fact, Jesus said that's an example of what I did when I was in the tomb, the bowels of the earth, and then three days later came out. So, so Jonah is in this great fish. And, um, that, you know, it was sort of a, a come-to-Jesus meeting. I guess it would be for you too if you wake up. You know, I've had people tell me I was bait, and uh, Jonah was bait, I guess, you know. And so, it, you know, Obviously, the fish was pretty big, and uh, probably for Jonah to be there in his mouth was sort of like giving a tic-tac to a whale, you know. But anyway, Jonah's foundering around in, the, in this fish, and, and he, he comes to himself, and he begins to cry out. And in his cry, he turns to Jesus. He, he, he repents, and he decides to obey. In fact, there's the theme of the Bible is there. Salvation is of the Lord, right there in the last part of that verse. And John, John says, I will, I will pay my vows. So, so at the bottom of that chapter, you could write this. Not only does God care whether I say yes, chapter 1, God cares when I say yes. You see, obedience is either immediate or it's not obedience. I know there are probably some of us right here who say, well, if I get my degree and I start thinking through about this, I'll say yes to God. If he asks me to go do this, go through that, you know, I get these courses. When I get this thing cooked, I, I'll say yes, I'll, I'll do whatever God wants. No, God cares whether you say yes right now because otherwise you are living, I'm living in disobedience. And this is a big deal to God. You see, saying no to God puts a lot of 
a lot of things at risk. I mean, it put Jonah at risk. It put the sailors at risk. It put Nineveh at risk. Just one guy saying no. So under that chapter, write this. God not only cares whether I say yes, God cares when I say yes. So when Jonah finally says yes, the whale burps, spits him up on, on the, the, the shore there. You say, I'm having trouble with that. Okay, stay with me. So here's Jonah on the shore. Can you imagine what he looked like? Pretty bleached out, I would, <laughs> I would imagine. Anyway, he's on the shore. What does he do? He goes to Nineveh. He gets to Nineveh, Mosul, Iraq. He gets over to that part of the world. And here is this city. Like I said, walls at least seven miles around. By the way, when Sennacherib was king... 150 years later, and you can read about Nahum and, and the prophecies that Nahum had because ultimately Nineveh was destroyed. You know, uh, their repentance didn't last long. But when Snecker was there, I mean, he had these beautiful, he bragged. It was a global event, uh, you know, when the, the city was finally completed, all the gardens and the palace with 80 rooms and all that. But this was, this was a little bit before then. So Jonah gets to, Jonah gets to Nineveh, and he starts go, walking across the city and he's preaching this. He said, you know, if you don't repent, God is going to destroy this city, and he's going to do it in 40 days. And when he got one day into the city, people began to weep. They were broken in repentance. And it is a matter of historical record that this is the single greatest spiritual awakening in history. I mean, a whole city, 120,000. Now, the spiritual awakenings here in the United States, you know, a couple of them in the last two centuries, previous two centuries, um, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people came to know Christ, but not so quickly and not so massively, not with such impact. The word got to the king. In fact, the king of Nineveh, now you think about this. This is the equivalent of the word getting to a city filled with ISIS, for instance. Although, as I said, it predated even that belief system. So, so there is repentance. People are, the king even makes an edict. He says, nobody is to eat anything or drink anything until we secure the fact that we have God's favor. And so the king and the entire city turns to Jonah, I mean to Jesus, or to God, because it would be the, the point being it's an Old Testament event, and so they're repenting and turning to God. Now, here is what I want to say. At the bottom of that chapter, write this. God also cares where I say yes. Jonah could have thought of a half dozen at least other cities whether he'd rather preached. And, and what I want you to see is this. Please see this. When you say yes to the Lordship of Christ in your life, you give up the right to choose your venue. I've been real interested lately in talking, and, and, and I don't hear this on this campus. I haven't heard it on this campus because I hadn't really asked anybody on this campus. But I, I've talked with a number of church planters, people who say, I want to be a church planter. And it's very interesting when I ask them where, um, especially, you know, some, where I don't hear many of them saying, God wants me to plant a church in the most down and out section of this town that I can find. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them will say, well, uh, we're going to go over here. There's this new area out here that's got these homes that are half a million and above, and I feel God leading me to call uh, to plant a church out there. Well, what, what they might be saying is I feel God leading me to plant a church building because, out there because I'm looking for some people who can afford it. But if you want to plant a church, you find the down and outs in any community, and you can plant a church. I mean, you can, you can really touch people's lives, people who are hungry. By the way, that's not, a bad, that's not a bad methodology when you consider it's just pretty much what Jesus did most of the time. All I'm saying is 
God cares where you say yes. Nineveh was not on any person's radar who believed in Jehovah God as far as a potential place for spiritual awakening. But yet it became the location for the greatest spiritual awakening in such a short time in all of history. So God cares whether I say yes. God cares when I say yes. God cares where I say yes. Oh, let's look at the last chapter. The last chapter is really interesting. Here we really get an insight into Jonah. And we get insight into the fact that God doesn't just care about what you do. He cares about why you do it. So that's going to be the last sentence. God cares why I say yes. He cares why. Because Jonah, once, once he saw God fall in this place and the people are repenting and they're turning to God and they're worshiping Jehovah God, once that happens, Jonah finds a hill outside of Nineveh and the real Jonah comes out. He starts pouting, and he said, I, I knew that you, you know, were slow to anger and that you were full of compassion and that this is what's going to happen. Here, these are our sworn enemies. I, I did this, and now you've let them have a spiritual awakening. That just bugs me. And so he's sitting out there on this hill. He, may, he builds a little booth, in fact, and... Um, of course, that's exposed to the elements. And, and uh, so God, see, God is not interested just in what you do. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in why you do it. Not just so you can check it off and tell somebody, hey, I shared the gospel with somebody or I went on this trip or I did. I, no, no, God is interested in why. Are you doing this out of love for him and love for the folks he loves? Or are you doing out this out of love for the accolades your friends would give you or what this will look like on your transcript? Why are you doing this? He really cares about that. So, so Jonah has a little, God has a little meeting with Jonah. I mean, it was nothing, no small thing to be a prophet in those days because God was really all over you. If, you know, he, he was interested in you. So he cared why Jonah did this. Jonah says, I knew this was going to happen. And so God, you recall, uh, God had this plant, this gourd plant grow up, and it gave him shade, and Jonah was so thrilled because, I mean, it was just, it was just hot out there. And uh, the next morning when he got up, God had caused a worm to eat the gourd, and so Jonah started pouting again. <laughs> and God said, you know, you, you are a really interesting guy. Uh, Jonah, you know, you cared for this vine. As a matter of fact, you cared for this vine that you didn't plant more than you care for Nineveh. If you cared for a stupid gourd, he didn't say stupid, but a gourd vine. If you cared for a gourd vine that grew up because it gave you shade, don't you think that you should care for the Ninevites in which city there are 120,000 people who don't even know their right hand from their left. So at the bottom of that chapter, you can write this sentence, God cares why I say yes. Okay, I'm going to just draw this thing to a close, and, and we're going we're gonna to make our way out of here. But before we do that, I, I, I want to do something that I should not do. Okay, the, the standard joke about old guys like me is that, yeah, every, it's always three points in a poem, okay? So I got that one, first part of that cooked, okay? We, we, we got four parts to this. Um, but, but, but I got to tell you that some years ago, I was reading a book which everybody in this room ought to read because, you know, I, I personally... I believe that OBU ought to be the one school where you ought not to be able to graduate without having overseas experience, but I'll, I'll beat that drum someplace else. Um, I, I think you ought to have a global vision, okay? But, but there, is a, there is a book, which it's an old book, um, uh, by Ellie Maxwell, who used to be president of Prairie Bible Institute, which uh, is just an incredible institution when it comes to sending out missionaries. And years ago, 
Uh, he was president. He's since passed away. And um, the title of the book is worth buying the book. The title of the book is World Missions, colon, Total War. Man, I, I like that. I, I think that's a good approach to it. World Missions, Total War, okay? And so in the book, oh, man, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it. Um, there's, this, there's this little poem. <laughs> I mean, even the guy's name who wrote it, Laskowski. I mean, I, anyways, it goes something like this. Jonah built a little booth, a shelter from the heat, and a gourd vine grew protection from the wind that on him beat. And Jonah rejoiced exceedingly glad for this convenient gourd, especially because the comfort was provided by the Lord. I thank you, Lord. You've been good to my dear wife and me. We're glad we're in this peaceful land and all this prosperity. It makes us feel so very good, this little bungalow, the kitchen and the living room, and the rug is soft, you know. And we love our children, everyone. We keep them home for God. The homeland needs them just as much as mission fields abroad. And conservative Christians are we, my children, wife, and I. So grateful that we're saved by grace and secure until we die. What did you say? Oh, Nineveh? <laughs> well, that's another thing. Right now, we're on the praise team, Lord, and to your glory sing. Thus, good old conservative Christian Jonas, to the Lord their praises tell. They sing, we're saved, and we're satisfied. While Nineveh goes to hell. If God cares about you and he cares whether you say yes and when you say yes and where you say yes and why you say yes, shouldn't you care about the people for whom he cares? I'm going to ask you to bow your head if you would. Father, I would just pray that you will teach us the importance of saying yes to you, yes to you. So uh, while our heads are bowed, just as a way of reaffirming for some of you what you've already said, but for others of you, for the very first, first time, just thinking seriously about it. If you would just say yes Lord, whatever you call me to do, whenever you call me, I want to have your heart about this. Lord, yes is my answer always to you. If you would say that, just in a spirit of prayer, would you just stand, please, just all over this room, just stand up. Lord, I am saying yes to you. Lord, you see into every heart here. You know whether even someone might have another agenda for standing. I sure don't want him or her to think that I wouldn't stand to say yes to Jesus, but it's the farthest thing from my mind. But Lord, I can't help but believe that most of us here are standing because we really want to say yes to you. And Lord, I can't help but believe that, that we're intelligent enough to find the counsel we need the mentor we need, the class we need, the teacher we need. Lord, Lord, saying yes to you in equivalent is the equivalent of letting you drop a divine plumb line down in our heart so that from now on we measure everything we do, every course we take, every place we go. We measure it by where it is in relation to this decision to say yes to the Lord. All of our activities, our thoughts, our motives. Is this, does this line up with my decision to say yes, Lord? Father, if it does for the majority of people in this room, at least, then this is a university that has every possibility of changing this world. I pray, God, it's true. And I pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. God bless you.